No, back uh, back in uh, I'm sorry to to say back in Egypt we used to to use for uh, evaluation and we we still also in the the starting uh, point for uh, evaluation. It doesn't mean. Uh, uh, that uh, you should say I am good or bad, but uh, this is important for the, the lecturer and for the students to uh, rectify the learning uh, experience. Okay, so take your time and uh, fill it in with... Uh, okay. Uh, today, we are uh, we are going to uh, to speak about the deep move out correction, but uh, first I have to say that I'm not satisfied uh, from yesterday lecture con concerning the frequency wave number transformation, so that I I will give a swift review again about the subject. And then we are going to, excuse me, uh, please, if you want to, to, to comment, just tell me you want to say something. Uh, I am democratic, I will give you the, the option to say what you like. And so, uh, doesn't mean I will obey what you say, but I will let you say what you want. That's all. Okay, but please do not uh, side talk with each other, with each other. Now, yesterday lecture, we were speaking about the uh, FK domain filtering. Today, we are going to make swift review, which uh, I hope it will be uh, it would be more uh, advanced than what I'm going to to tell you today, but. At least I will point out some points, that some important uh, points, and maybe I will uh, uh, post some uh, models on the e-learning and on the, uh, the blend space that may help understand how to deal with uh, FK domain. Because uh, uh, as we, uh, we speak about from a frequency, time frequency uh, transform or frequency time transform, we, we can see the data in different way. And so we, we need to, to understand what different way means. So it's not mapping point by point from uh, time domain to frequency domain or frequency domain or from space domain to wave number domain, but it's different view of the model itself. So, I'd like to start by the equation we usually use for the transform. This is the transformed elastic or seismic wave fields in terms of wave number and omega, where omega is the angular frequency and equal to 2 by f. Also, wave number is equal to 2 by uh, uh, divided by uh, lambda. Uh, uh, we have here double integration. The original wave field in terms of space and time, x and t, multiplied by exponential minus i omega t plus kx dx dt. Which means, as we, we discussed earlier, that integration is in fact summation. Okay? Integration, you have to keep this in mind. Integrate is to sum, sum something. But uh, uh, it depends on this fraction, dx and, and dt. How is the distance between each two successive points and how this result in the exact uh, value of the integration? So what we are doing is we are, we are summing the representation, the Fourier series for time for our field, and the Fourier series for space for our field, and then for certain value for k and omega, we map this point. In our case, 
the velocity here becomes omega divided by k. So omega divided by k now is uh, velocity or more specifically is the phase velocity. So what is the situation exactly here in our, uh, we have two videos because I, I, I'm assuming I gave you some um, um, information that n needs to be um, to be corrected. So at least we can see this uh, this uh, photo. In fact, what we are doing, we have the elastic wave field. This represents the wave runs, okay? And the elastic wave field is, of course, continuous wave field, meaning at any point, I'm, I'm going to observe wave both in time and space, okay? But what is the situation in our exercise? We are recording the elastic wave field or the seismic wave field using geophones, okay? These geophones is distributed with certain interval between each one. So, in fact, what we are doing is that we are sampling the Earth's wave field in space. Again, we are sampling the Earth's wave field in space. From a spatial point of view, we are, these are, these are our geophones. And of course, the elastic wave field is continuous. These are the wave front. So what I'm doing using the geophones is that I am sampling or digitizing the elastic wave field. Again, we are not measuring the true or the complete elastic wave field. Rather, we are measuring certain samples, both in space and time. Okay? Because if I, I, uh, I put geophone here between two successive geophones, I will have more information. And so on. Okay? So, the information I obtain is not the complete one, but it depends on the sampling both in time and domain, uh, and space, sorry. So, for the space domain, the features that I can distinguish depends on the wavelengths, because uh, when we have uh, the dimension of this object uh, greater than the wavelengths, we expect to have difference in the wave field. This difference in the wave field is represented here at the surface at the geophone. We can correlate from geophone to geophone. So far, so good. So far, un you understand what I'm saying? No, somebody is saying no. Now we are going to, to try to find an, an, an example that will, uh, will make the idea more uh, clear to you. Okay? Suppose I have feature that sends energy in all direction in a spherical manner. Okay? And suppose that 
I am taking small fraction here and suppose I am distributing my geophones so dense in this place. Can you understand or define or deduce that this elastic wave field from only these points it's spherical? For you it will look like plane, straight line or plane. Okay? Suppose we are making our sampling at greater distances. Okay, now we can say we can feel the spherical better. Okay, but if we have interaction in the source that the elastic wave field itself is not perfectly, perfectly spherical. Say, have some, some sort of notch, something like here, like that. Where is this? Yes. Something here. Suppose, for certain reason, we have change in the wave field for any reason. In this manner, can this distribution, the larger one, such effect? Can it feel this such effect? No. How come? How? Because it will not observe. It's not, there is no observation here. For in, in our life, in our daily life, you have ability to hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Voices below 20 hertz and above 20,000 hertz, we cannot hear. Although you, there might be large or loud voices around us, but we, we don't hear. Why? Because the sampling, we are sampling in this region from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Other bands are not. Also, uh, looking at some place, if you have, uh, say, for example, if you have uh, your, your FYP project and you have uh, camera or the, the instrument you used for the clouds and so. So also, this, all these instruments have a certain uh, resolution better. So if the cloud is, is smaller than a certain dimension, it will not feel it, okay? If the, if the, uh, the change in the, in, in, in the, in the cloud is uh, so regional, we, we also, with single station at USM, we will not feel such a change. So we will act in, in our window. Do you, do, you, do you follow me now? So, this a change in space is represent, represented by the wave number. The wave number is representing such a change in space. Okay? So, if we apply the FK domain for the TX domain, we can see the data in a way 
different than the time distance or the time space domain, which may help us to identify features that is not identifiable. For example, I can identify the, the, the dimensions, I can identify the, the velocities and so on. So here the wave number equals 2 by divided by L, where L here is a wave length. And you understand that the wavelength is the, the, the distance between two successive uh, points with the same phase on the wave train. So this wavelength, the inverse of this wavelength is the wave number analogous to the frequency where the frequency is the inverse of period. So to, to end this discussion, and I will make uh, some uh, synthetic example I will produce myself and submit to you on uh, uh, e-learning. This was uh, the example yesterday. This is a TX domain. I can see, the, I can look or graph this data in trace form, trace by trace, like the usual way we are uh, normally do. Or I can sample the traces at certain time with distances to produce out the spatial feature of the wave itself. Okay? So, for example, if I have at say this is uh, 200, I, I think this is 200 millisecond. If I'm doing sampling here, the feature will be something like but this in the space and so on for all distances, for all time, uh, time shots. So this at 200, 400, and uh, 600, and so on. So if I'm using the relation and integrate or sum the amplitudes for both time and uh, space for obtaining the wave number frequency domain, I will obtain something like that. This figure or this panel does not uh, easily identify, is not uh, easily identifiable. It needs some, uh, Yvonne, okay. it needs some sort of uh, uh, modeling and interpretation to define the values here, to, to define this is the ground roll and this is the reflection and this is some other uh, noises we have. For this example we have speak, we, 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 we discussed yesterday, it is synthetic one. So as it is synthetic one, we know previously the various types of energy. So we can identify that this one is a reflection and this one is a ground roll and this one is other type of energies might be refraction and diffraction and any other kind of energy. But we need to model and we need to make iterative work to clearly identify each type of this, of these energies we have. Okay? But why we say that this part is the reflection energy? Because the reflection energy, according to the situation here, it is the highest frequency and the horizontal frequency due to the small angle because, and take care of what, what we are uh, saying or to what we are, what we are uh, understanding or, uh, or, or what we have from the record. We are speaking about small offset. 
So because we are working on a small offset, we have a small theta, small angle of, in, uh, in, of intersection and angle of uh, uh, emergence. Angle of emergence, we have very small with the perpendicular, which result in high horizontal velocity. Otherwise, if we have large offset, the situation will be changing and our interpretation will also change. Okay? So I wanted to, to review this because I felt like it's not uh, totally understandable and uh, we will uh, make some uh, models and will be posted on e-learning uh, this uh, weekend, inshallah. And uh, I hope we will have discussion uh, online about this. Also next week, I hope Tuesday will be uh, good for us, but uh, unfortunately we... Uh, no, not for unfortunately, because it's, it's a holiday and you are uh, happy for that. So it's, it's okay for you. <laughs> but for, for myself, I, 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 do, I do want to give you more uh, information. Okay, now we go to dip move out. Now we, we have another complication to the problem. We start by horizontal interface, homogeneous, and now we are turning back to the situation where we have dipping interface. The upper panel you, you see is the effect of the dipping interface. You can see that we have uh, some uh, problem. These problems are first, the midpoints is no longer, the actual midpoint is no longer in the midway between the source and receiver. It's now moving up dip, and as you see, as the, the offset increase, the smearing or the movement is higher. Uh, also that, if we uh, make NMO correction and we apply velocity, we will have a corrected trace with, with, with no problem, other than that the velocity we will obtain is not the true velocity. It will be the apparent velocity. Why? Because of the uh, component due to the dipping of interface. Okay? So, when we apply the NMO correction for the same big other, this one in the panel, we assume we are dealing with horizontal layers, giving rise to quasi-hyperbolic events. Quasi means uh, not true, look, looking like uh, hyperbolic, but not truly hyperbolic. This is the, word, the meaning of the word quasi. Uh, when we have dimming reflectors, the NMO correction still corrects for the hyperbolic move out, but the velocity in this case, the velocity in case uh, is not the true one, but it is uh, uh, apparent due to the term, due to the dip of the reflector. Uh, in order to obtain the true velocity, an extra term needed to be added and an extra correction for the dip is called dip move out and abbreviated to DMO. So, one, one may uh, ask me or ma may ask himself if, if somebody asks himself, I hope so. <laughs> uh, if you ask yourself, so why should I bother myself and worry about the, the, this is apparent velocity as long as when apply NMO correction, everything goes fine and the, the hyperbolic form is removed and everything is okay. So, uh, did anybody uh, ask, ask himself this question? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> Why? Uh, 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 I'm, 
I'm not meaning why you didn't ask, because it's 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 a spontaneous uh, discussion. But why should? And now this is a question to you. Why 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 should we correct for the dipping reflector? Although applying NMO correction gives good uh, removal of NMO, and we have. We can apply stacking and so with no problem. For until this point. Excuse me? We don't get get an exact image of the subject. Suppose we, 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 we got an an exact image. So what's the problem? Adi, what's the problem? We'll have we we'll have examination tomorrow. It will be between uh, I, I guess we accept uh, six and seven. It will be between six and seven, and you have no excuse this time. Okay. So why? The okay. Okay, suppose we don't have this problem, suppose the, the neighboring points are somehow the same, so uh, we can ignore such effect. But there is effect that much more pronounced that we cannot ignore. That we have, or we, have, we are dealing with the apparent velocity. And this apparent velocity from the assignment you have done is used as a final stage to remove or to, to change or to convert your work from time domain into depth or from seismic section into geologic section. So if you are using wrong velocity, although it gives good uh, image, but you will end up with bad Geologic section. It's not. It will not represent. It might be uh, much deeper or much shallower than the true one. From the figure, it's visible also that the CMB points do not lie in the mid distance between the source and the receiver, and the midpoints are smeared in the up dip direction. Uh, they are uh, accumulating smearing, accumulating in the up uh, direction. Our intention here is to find that extra, ter extra term that corrects for the dipping of the reflector. Uh, we always start in reflection, in refraction, and everything we start by defining the time. And to define the time, you should start by define the length of the ray. Okay? So here we want to define the, the, the length of the ray uh, from, the, from the source to receiver, which can be defined from this relation. It is 2xh square as xh square as the depth as the midway, the mid distance between the source and the receiver, plus 2dr square, it's the depth, the vertical depth between the, the receiver and the reflector, minus 2xh times 2dr cosine by over 2 plus alpha. And this can be further simplify, simplified to 4xh square plus 4d square plus 8xh dr sine alpha. And if you remember, in uh, geometry classes, even in the higher school or uh, maybe preparatory school, this is the equation for obtaining lengths for non-Pythagorean 
triangle with non-normal angle. So if this is the, uh, say, alpha, and I want to, to get the length from here to, to there, this one, it will be uh, this, uh, this line square, uh, this side square plus this side square minus two, the multiplication of this uh, line or this side times this side, cosine uh, alpha, okay? So this represent, excuse me, Okay. This relation can be obtained or identified from this figure. We have this, the source receiver distance. Here is the DR, the, the depth uh, beneath the, uh, the receiver and here the point H the, is the midway. This is the common midpoint. Okay, and uh, XH is half the distance between the source and the receiver. Uh, so if we want to, to define the distance taken from uh, the source to, to the receiver, we just uh, extend this to good the image of R here, which will be in the straight line with this one, and then apply the, uh, re the relation we just seen for the, uh, uh, for the triangle to obtain the, the bus from R to, to S. Now we're returning back. So now we have XH is the, the half the distance between the source and the receiver. DR is the distance, uh, is the depth below the receiver. And sine alpha is the angle of dip. Uh, in order to get rid of DR, because we, we are not interested in DR, but rather we are interested in DH, the depth below the midpoint itself. So DH equal DH1 plus DH2, which means that uh, we have DH1 uh, plus DH2 equal to DR plus XH sine alpha from the, the triangle. And then substituting for DR to obtain that uh, the relation will be 4XH, 4XH squared plus 4DH minus XH sine alpha squared plus 8XH sine alpha times DH minus XH sine alpha. So all what we have done is that we removed DR and substitute the, the value uh, from the other uh, relation. By simplifying the, the relation, we end up with uh, R squared equal 4DH, uh, 4DH squared plus 4XH uh, squared cosine squared alpha. Okay, and this is obtained by the uh, substituting 1 minus sine alpha by cosine alpha. Uh, 1 minus sine squared alpha by cosine squared uh, alpha. So after uh, defining the distance, we can uh, have, we can estimate the time by dividing the, the, the distance by the velocity. So we have t, the travel time, equal r divided by uh, the speed, the velocity, which equal square root t square, uh, th square plus 4x square h cosine square alpha divided by c square. Where th itself is uh, 2dh divided by c. The, the true velocity we have is related with the apparent velocity with the relation. Here we are, we are speaking about yesterday or previously we were speaking about 
uh, horizontal uh, velocity. Now we are speaking or discussing vertical velocity, so the uh, the dip velocity, the, the dipping velocity equals c cosine alpha. Here, c uh, dipping, the velocity due to dipping, can give good NMO correction, although that the velocity is not true. So, okay, we understand that it, it's okay, but we have problem with velocity for inverting for dips. But now we are going to discover some other problem that also force us to apply deep move out correction. So, as the situation is like the panel above, we have the, uh, and the reflector with varying depths, we have horizontal plane, and then we have dipping plane. Then, the leftmost side, this is uh, the representation, this is what, what happens when we, uh, apply, when we have raw data. Then after applying the uh, uh, normal move out, and then finally after correcting for dip move out. This case is called conflicting dip, which means that at the same point, we have two dip for the reflector. We have horizontal dipping, and we have, uh, we, we have horizontal uh, plane, and we have dipping uh, plane at the same point. And this is called conflicting dip. Every time we, when we deal with imaging the Earth's interior, or the subsurface, we have to keep we have to keep in our mind that we are dealing with geology. So, and that's what uh, I guess we we understand from the FYP uh, work we, we have done is that after certain point after uh, arriving to certain uh, discovery, we have to ask ourselves. Does uh, or, or is this discovery or are these discoveries are geologically meaningful? Is it logic from the geologic point of view or not? So if not, and this is the difference between a human and computer, because computer, computer generally cannot think in, in that manner. He will obey what you gave him. So he will not consider, no, no, no. Although I have the minimum error, no, this model is not, is not true. And is there, is there any problem one? Do you have any problem? Okay. So I, I will say, okay, no, I have to uh, look for another model. So this feature, is not geologically possible. It's not, from the geological point of view, possible to have something like that. So, it's a problem and should be uh, removed. To remove, we have to define certain parameter, certain other correction for the dipping, for the effect of dipping. And now the time for the correction will be uh, t equal square root uh, t square dmo plus 4x uh, h, uh, 4xh square divided by c square where t dmo equal the equation we have uh, before uh, square root t square h minus 4x square h sine square alpha divided by c square Finally, the correction applied for the NMO uh, correction will be T1 equal T DMO times 1 minus X1 minus XH squared divided by XH squared 
all under square root. So, uh, what is the flow chart to apply the deep move out uh, correction? Uh, first, we apply NMO correction with the uh, apparent velocity or the deep velocity we have. Then, we sort the data to common offset gathers. Then, we apply DMO. Then, we sort the data back to CMB gather. And then, we inverse NMO with velocities from the first NMO. We return back to the original case after removing the tip move out. And then, apply NMO again with the true velocities. Again, we apply NMO with the apparent velocity. And then, we sort the data to common offset gathers. And then, we apply DMO. And then, we sort the data back to CMB gather. We return back to CMB gather. And then, we inverse. Inverse NMO means removing the, NM, the original NMO correction we have made in the first step. And then, afterwards, we apply NMO now with the true velocities. Okay? Uh, this represents the model, uh, sorry, an example for uh, the deep move out. The upper panel represents the situation with uh, conflicting dip before DMO correction, whereas in the uh, lower panel, here we have the dip mobile correction uh, to some extent uh, removed. Okay? Thank you, and if you have any question, I'll be happy. Okay? Yes. Uh, no, no, common offset is not the CMB. Uh, if you say common shot, it means from the set, from the same shot. If you say, if you see common midpoint, you are saying from the same point. So if you say common offset, so you are using the same offset. You are collecting from the same offset. Again, please. The, to, to apply the DMO correction. For for what? No, for M, for NMO we 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 use uh, CMB gather, not a common offset offset uh, gather. For NMO we use common midpoint gather. Okay. And then we correct for the zero offset, and then apply stacking. So probably you need to review uh, your information and you to review the class again. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time for so, so you, you have to exert uh, much effort. Yes? The one that we get from the set. Yes. Okay. Yes? Okay. Again?
No. Uh, let's start. We have, due to the, due to, uh, the dipping reflector, the effect will be uh, in the time. Okay? So, if we correct the effect of timing due to dip move to uh, due to dipping, then applying normal move out will yield the true velocity. Again, now we have the traces, the original one, including both the slant or the normal move out plus the dipping move out. So, if you remove the effect of dipping, okay, so you have uh, the only the normal move out effect uh, left. So, in this case, when you apply velocity, after removing the dip move out, these velocities will be the true one. Okay, now, now I have two, uh, two effects. So I removed one, which is a dipping, and the, the, the left is a normal move out. So now I correct for the normal move out to obtain the true velocity and to uh, carry out stacking and so on. It's okay? I have error in time or a change in time from the normal offset, from the zero offset, due to two factors. The normal move out, the moving away from the normal direction, and dipping. Applying velocity, in this case, will represent, will give me apparent velocity, although I have good stacking, good normal move out uh, output away from the uh, conflicting uh, dip. So, in this case, the velocity I obtain is not the true one. Why? Because it's not dependent only on the time of the uh, moving away from the normal or normal move out. Okay? So, removing the dip, I will have only the effect of normal move out. So applying the normal move out correction here will yield the true velocity. Okay, you, uh, you got it or you lost? <laughs> okay, are you lost, Ashraf? You lost. No, Ashraf, now you have, uh, you won't say we, we speak about money. Okay? Say you, you, you want to, to buy something, but uh, you don't know uh, actually the, the value of this uh, thing. But uh, in your invoice, you, 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 you realized you, you bought two, two things. Okay? One of these things is market which here is the dip move out, if we define the, 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 the normal move out, the dip move out, and deduct its value from what of bid, so the rest will be the true value, the true price of the thing I, I, uh, I purchase. Okay? So, it's like uh, you have effect of two and you want to eliminate one to get the other. So now we're eliminating the effect of dip move out, to get the velocity, uh, the true velocity for the normal move out. Okay?